I will like to welcome you to this session on uh, Indigenous Voices from the Arctic. And first I would like to thank the organizers for another exciting conference. And just, it just shows that uh, the Arctic is getting more and more international interest and uh, which we, people in the North and living in the Arctic, experience ourselves on a daily basis. So that's why I think conferences like this are so important, where you, through your uh, good dialogues, your collaboration and the inclusion, uh, for example, of indigenous peoples um, uh, are included in the conference. The speakers in this session are working for the rights of the peoples that they're representing on a daily basis. And it's in different forums, and it's an hour for me to chair this session. We have four speakers, and uh, I will try and make sure that we keep the time. And I really look forward to this uh, session and the presentations. And I will make sure that there will be time for, for questions in the end. So the first speaker will be Terry Outler. He is na the national Inuit leader and president of Inuit Dabirit Ganadami. Terry, the floor is yours. Ublakut. Uh, for those of you that don't know uh, my language, good morning. First of all, I would like to thank uh, President Grimson for his uh, kind invitation for, for me to partic participate in this uh, Arctic Circle Conference. And that uh, it wouldn't necessarily be a fulsome discussion on the Arctic if you don't include the, the people of the Arctic. As Canada's national Inuit leader, I am honored and privileged to represent close to 60,000 Inuit in Canada. And I was quite impressed to see the, the previous panel uh, based on the science and the research in the Arctic and, and the, the, the fellow from Korea had, had a slide up uh, with my hometown of uh, Resolute Bay. Our northern homeland or Inuit Nunangat in Inuktitut spans about 40% of Canada's land mass and 50% of Canada's coastline. To put this into perspective, it is a land mass between the size of Australia and India, peppered with only 53 com communities and no roads. Our communities are accessed by plane or sea. Inuit have only had earnest and sustained contact with the outside world for a generation or two. In fact, there are many Canadian Inuit alive today who were raised in nomadic communities, in igloos and sealskin tents, traveling the Arctic land and sea by dog team and kayak, tracking game and marine mammals for survival. In a matter of decades, Inuit have moved to, selling, to settling in static communities and often overcrowded houses with an inadequate access to services like health care and education. Where we used to get our food exclusively from the land and sea, we now go grocery shopping for southern food at high prices and low nutritional value compared to our country food from the land and sea. In some communities, a loaf of bread can cost $8 and two liters of milk goes for $13. We still supplement our diet with traditional food sources, regularly like caribou, seal, polar bear, and walrus. In fact, about 70% of Inuit families still rely on country food for a part of our diet, providing for a family until very recently entailed exclusively hunting, gathering, sewing, and building. For the majority of Inuit, it now means going to school, getting a job, and probably moving far away from home. Providing for a family until very recently is essential for, for, for our generation, where we've made the rocky transition from Eskimo to Inuit, or from the igloo to the iPhone, and the incredibly rapid speed 
of this transition has come with its share of challenges. Our communities persistently struggle with economic and social challenges, including access to affordable and appropriate food, physical and mental health support, and disproportionate rates of diseases like tuberculosis, which around the world everyone thinks is a bygone disease. Infant mortality rates and low life expectancy are among our many concerns. As we work to combat these troubling challenges in our communities for thousands of years has allowed us to learn us the remoteness and relative isolation of our communities for thousands of years has allowed us to learn from the past. In our history of relations with outsiders, Inuit opinions are not always considered and sometimes not even really heard. Even our history of relations with outsiders, Inuit opinions have not always been considered. Upon our first encounter with the European system of governance, which was very different from what we were used to within our community and uh, camp structures, we were told that all lands and waters in Inuit Nunungat, our Inuit homeland, were owned by the Crown, and all the rights and privileges that attached to sovereignty and ownership, notably the power to make binding laws impacting the lives of Inuit, rested in the hands of political institutions located elsewhere. In this process, we were led to believe that we had no place at all. Starting in the 1960s, a succession of young Inuit decided to take on these concepts and regain at least a degree of control of our own lives. We took the approach that our decolonization had to feature a fundamental reassertion and rebalancing of our rights and responsibilities with others, including governments located outside the Arctic. In the last quarter of the 20th century, the work by these young Inuit to rebalance our rights and responsibilities gave way to large regional modern treaties. Five agreements with the Crown were eventually signed and, from a, and formed a continuous chain across the Canadian Arctic from the Alaska border to the Labrador coast and are protected by Section 35 of Canada's 1982 Constitution Act. Our agreements have interpretive primacy over any conflicting federal, provincial, and territorial laws. Together, these treaties make Inuit the largest non-Crown landowners in Canada and in North America by a considerable distance, and much of this land has rich mineral potential, and our treaties have provided us with capital funds to kickstart economic development ventures. Fast forward a few more decades to today, with our agreements being implemented, we find ourselves with a new wave of external forces that are pushing into our homeland, the romanticized visions of our, of our frozen tundra and ice, as well as quests for economic gains in our vast territories. This new incarnation of colonization is heralded by a clarion by clarion calls by outsiders, often Europeans and Californians, to save the Arctic. In this clamor, who is asking Inuit what we think should happen in our homeland with our Arctic environment and the wildlife with which we share the land and sea and from which we survive? The seal, the polar bear, the walrus, the whale. How do Inuit see the future of the Arctic and Arctic development? These are campaigns, oftentimes well-intentioned, to save the Arctic from climate change. But as we all know, climate change does not happen in the Arctic or is not stemming from the Arctic. It's stemming from the modern societies in the South where the carbon emissions are being spewed. So if you want to save the Arctic, you look at your own backyard. We're doing fine in the Arctic. The Inuit have always considered ourselves as stewards of the Arctic. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. The next speaker is Anas Oskal. He is uh, the executive director for the International Center for Reindeer Husbandry. He works for the Association of Reindeer Herders and a uh, member in the board of the Arctic Economic Council. Here we are. 
Thank you. Honorable President Grimson, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, try to bring some perspectives uh, to this uh, uh, great audience from the point of view of reindeer herders. Uh, reindeer herding is a circumpolar phenomenon. Uh, it is practiced today in Norway, Sweden, Finland, Russia, Mongolia, China, Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and also in Scotland. Uh, in fact, uh, since we have the Honorable President with us, I would like to reiterate our offer to turn Iceland into a reindeer herding nation anytime soon, as you are the only Arctic nation that doesn't have herding. Uh, be that as it may, uh, there is a diversity of indigenous peoples and indigenous cultures built on reindeer herding. 24 different uh, indigenous groups base their lives on herding reindeer. And it is, uh, it, at this conference, we've heard a lot about uh, the new opportunities in, in the Arctic. Reindeer herding is one of the existing economic uh, sectors, industries, if you will. And it is the basis upon which our cultures are formed. And it is a typical indigenous livelihood, way of life. We could also see it representing a human-coupled ecosystem where people and nature and animals are very strongly tied together. We, it can also be seen as a model of management of the barren Arctic uh, land areas, a model which has been developed and transferred over many, many generations, centuries, millennia. And today, as we've heard indeed these days, Global change is real in the Arctic. It is uh, creating a complex picture of changing factors. And climate change is the most uh, severe long-term driver. But there are also other types of change. And indeed, the combination of these different types of change is what uh, gives us a legitimate concern for the sustainability, future sustainability of some of these groups. Uh, I would um, like to say that today we see an explosion of research, development, and policy interests in the Arctic, which we also see as our homelands. And I would like to show you this quote by the Arctic parliamentarians. It's uh, soon 10 years ago when they said that we need to find ways to stay ahead of this development. Perhaps now is the time to look back at these eight years and see, assess how, how well we have done. So the big question uh, facing reindeer herding uh, communities is how do we build our societies strong for the future? Resilient, robust societies. And I will try to elaborate on a uh, few ways in which I think we could uh, address this important topic. First of all, what we are worrying about is uh, passive local communities in face of this uh, profound and historical change. Therefore, I think it is very needed to have also long-term responses to our challenges, so to work with youth is very important. We are currently about to finalize an Arctic Council project uh, called Alin Reindeer Herding Youth, hosted by the Russian Federation and Norway. I would especially like to uh, commemorate the strong support from the Sakha Republic in this regard. Uh, this project seeks to build the competence, the knowledge and understanding of young reindeer herders, to train them to become the geopolitical leaders of the future, to build their competence, but not least their confidence. Leadership is key. Another issue uh, close to our heart is that of traditional knowledge. And this is the knowledge upon which our communities have been founded, our cultures are built. And I would just like to uh, remind the audience that the fifth report of IPCC, uh, the Polar Regions chapter, uh, to which I was a co-author, uh, have identified the three main risks for the polar regions. But what I like to state is that as a response to these key risks, 
uh, IPCC have concluded that there is a need to focus, to make use of also indigenous or traditional knowledge. We need to use the best available knowledge to find the answers for our common future. If we look at what is happening in practice, though, the picture is somewhat different because there are barriers for including traditional knowledge in the management of the Arctic. I think everyone agrees that traditional knowledge would be important from a cultural point of view, but our point is that it is real knowledge, it is tested knowledge, knowledge that should be applied and put to use to manage our homelands in the future. Another issue is that, well, we know the Arctic is changing, but change means both challenges as well as opportunities. A paradox is that uh, our uh, nomadic, fragmented communities are often finding themselves in a situation where they are not able to get into position to exploit the opportunities that arise from Arctic change. And so this is uh, an issue that we also need to have a focus on. On the other hand, the uh, traditional knowledge of Arctic indigenous peoples are strong, and the, there is a diversity of traditional food cultures that are very rich and that has not been used properly, in my opinion, to develop societies, develop local economies and sustainable futures. So to utilize the knowledge of the people to maintain and develop their own societies and well-being is key. And I would just like to uh, show you something. This is a very special, very good soup, reindeer soup, made in, uh, by Evan Reindeerherdes. I'm mentioning this because yesterday at the Northern Forum reception hosted by uh, President Borisov of Sakha Republic, we were able to get a taste of, of these uh, food delicacies. So our idea is that by using our own knowledge, in this case on food culture, we would be bringing a new approach to address Arctic change. And this is why we have formed what we call the Arctic Indigenous Peoples Culinary Institute to address this by use of documentation, research and education to make also a foundation, better foundation for local business development in Arctic Indigenous societies. And we think it's very timely because climate change is also about what we are going to eat in the future. If you will Please imagine that you are part of this nomadic family living in the most extreme areas in the Russian high north. Uh, is it the sugar industry and the, the, the food industry solutions that will, will secure uh, these people? Uh, food safety, food security is also an important issue uh, in uh, the Arctic Council. So to wrap up, the Arctic is changing, we know that how to handle it. We need active local societies. We need to build local capacity and leadership, youth. We need to use the best available knowledge, science and traditional knowledge to cope. And we need to get our communities into position to also exploit the opportunities at hand. And in this way, we strongly believe that it's important that an opportunity should be an opportunity for all. Thank you. Thank you, Anas. Anas promised me he would use just five minutes, but <laughs> it took a little more. Thank you. The next speaker is Ukalop. Igis, yeah, she is the chair of uh, Inuit Circle Polar Council. Okay, look, the floor is yours. Kuyil namik, amalu kuyil namik, angi jakak, tunga si ditsikat si tabani, teko tabani katika Inuit, ilisakay gumamit jakka, di kuwilo si Inuit. I'd like you to look around the room and look at the Inuit who are here with me. If you would uh, stand up, there's uh, Alaskans over there. There's Canadians over here. We have Greenlanders. Um, 
the, these are the people that you talk to when you come, want to come up and navigate around our waters or extract, resource develop, ec ec extract resources in our communities. So these are the people that you talk to. I'd also like to recognize the indigenous peoples who are here in the room. I'd like to, to uh, stand up as well, just to have a visual as to who you need to speak to when you come to our communities. Indigenous people, Not just Inuit, <laughs> the Sami. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, and I'd like to recognize and acknowledge the work that Kupit Kleist did to get uh, especially Inuit here. Um, I know that he worked very hard to ensure that uh, people like me and Terry were here. So thank you, Kupit. I'm going to repeat some of what uh, Terry said. I think it's worth repeating because we're kind of in the same boat across the circumpolar world as Inuit. Inuit are an international people. As the international chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, I represent more than 150,000 Inuit in Alaska, Canada, Greenland, and Chikaka. It's often difficult for Inuit from Chikaka to travel to forums like this, and I am privileged to be represent, representing them in these forums. Our relationship at ICC is based on a common culture and language. For most of human history, the indigenous peoples of the circumpolar north have been at the top of the world, living their lives and carrying on their traditional ways. Iceland is the only Arctic state that does not have indigenous peoples. No one lived here until the Nordic peoples arrived more than 1,000 years ago. So it's always interesting for me to attend conferences like this one. Suddenly, interest in the Arctic is now widespread. This, this has all happened in a relatively short time. In the short time I have today, I want to leave with two messages. The first is a cautionary message that I heard last night again uh, when the president spoke to those who might see the Arctic as an empty wilderness or an open frontier, where they have complete license to assert their own interests. The second message is an offer of cooperation and collaboration. Until recently, not many people from the South have had an opportunity, an opportunity to visit Arctic regions. Transportation costs are high, distances are huge, communities are remote, and the climate is not for everyone. For my first message, as that, to say that the Arctic is not empty, indigenous peoples have lived in this region for thousands of years. For whatever reason, many newcomers to the Arctic see it as a governance vacuum or a region that should be considered the common heritage of mankind. These perceptions often overlook the people who live in the Arctic and minimize the importance of exi existing governance systems. For example, as Terry said, in my own country, Canada, Inuit are the largest landowners in the Arctic. About 20% of the central Arctic Ocean can be considered international space. The rest of the land and sea in the Arctic is subject to the sovereignty and the sovereign rights of the eight Arctic states. Inuit live in four of these Arctic states and have a variety of legal and political rights protected by domestic and international law. In 2009, Inuit adopted a circumpolar Inuit Declaration on Sovereignty in the Arctic. In that declaration, we stated that the conduct of international relations in the Arctic and the resolution of international disputes in the Arctic are not the sole preserve of Arctic states and non-Arctic states. These matters are also within the purview of the indigenous peoples of the Arctic. Issues of sovereignty and sovereign rights in the Arctic have become tightly linked to issues of self-determination in the Arctic. Inuit and Arctic states must therefore work closely together and constructively to chart the future of the Arctic. But the Inuit voice is not just an Arctic voice. Inuit are part of the global family of indigenous peoples, and we are also involved in promoting and protecting indi indigenous peoples' rights through the United Nations. 
Indeed, we're pleased to see the UN General Assembly adopt the outcome document at the recent World Conference on Indigenous Peoples in New York. That was in September. The outcome document contains very important language. States commit themselves to make an effort to implement the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples locally, nationally, and internationally. I'm going through this quickly because I see the time. In cooperation with Indigenous Peoples. So when I, came, when I come to these conferences and hear all the plans that people from other parts of the world have for the Arctic, I sometimes feel a bit nervous. You can try a mental exercise, if you bear with me for just a second. Suppose the Inuit, Athabascans, Sami, and, num and numerous indigenous peoples of Russia convened a conference in your part of the world where we talk about or lay out new ways for you to govern yourself. Set new priorities for research and development in your communities. Impose new rules for how you protect your local environment and call for bans on which animals you can use on your farms and ranches. Wouldn't be a, would it be a different world? <laughs> I suspect that you wouldn't pay much attention to us. Inuit are aware that the Arctic has great resource wealth. We are also aware of the increasing global demand for Arctic minerals, hydrocarbon, hydrocarbons, and living marine resources. Inuit are always described as being adapt adaptable. And we are determined to provide for the material and cultural well-being of Inuit into the future. I'll just skim through the... Uh, we also have another declaration at ICC that was adopted in May 2011. It's called the Circumpolar Inuit Declaration on Resource Development Principles in Inuit Nunat. I encourage you to look up ICC's website and, and read through that document. <clears throat> in Inuvik, in July, where I was uh, appointed the ICC chair, Inuit talked about the Kitingaluit uh, Declaration. It sets out our plan for the next four years in my, uh, uh, while I'm acting chair. So the Inuit agenda for, for, the, Inuit agenda for the next four years uh, include the Arctic Council and in other international fora, environmental stewardship, safe shipping and fisheries, sustainable economic development, Inuit health and well-being, food security, communication, education and language, and traditional knowledge and science. So before I close off, I, I want to talk about my second message, that we are uh, open for uh, cooperation and collaboration with people who want to do business in the Arctic. We simply ask that you respect our culture and long history as residents of this beautiful region. And we ask that you consult with us before you try to reinvent the Arctic according to your own interests. And I'll repeat what Terry just said. If you want to help the Arctic, I also encourage you to think about what you need to do differently in the South, in the places where you live, rather than suggesting to us how we govern ourselves differently in the North. Consider how your activities in the South are impacting us in the Arctic and make some adjustments close to, closer to home. I'm not suggesting that you want to close the Arctic to others. We realize that the enthusiasm and interest of people and organizations at this conference are built on good intentions. ICC is always interested in, in opportunities to develop partnerships and work in, co in cooperative and collaborative ways. So I look, working, I look forward to work with all our governments in the Arctic states in moving and advancing our issues forward. Great to me. Thank you, Ugalup. The last speaker in this session is Alexei Chukalov. He is the Vice Chair of the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Mr. President, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, 
It's a great honor and privilege for me to represent the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at such a significant gathering. In 2007, UN Human Rights Council established a subsidiary body to be provided with a substantive thematic advice in sphere of indigenous people's rights. After eight years of hard research work, the expert, me expert mechanism's mandate is aimed to be reviewed and improved by monitoring and evaluation functions in order to achieve more effective implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. At the opening session of the Arctic Circle this year, His Excellency, President of Finland, mentioned the high-level plenary meeting of the UN General Assembly to be known as World Conference on Indigenous Peoples. After long negotiation process, UN member states endorsed with consensus an outcome document which reaffirmed member states' obligations to overcome the gap between hopes and aspirations of indigenous peoples and policies offered by states. I'm very delighted to stress the constructive role of Arctic states in the preparation process for the World Conference. However, there are still some concerns about common understanding among states of some fundamental indigenous rights, as for instance, the right of indigenous peoples to free, prior, and informed consent. UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is treated as a minimum standard for indigenous people's dignity, survival, and development. We need all the time to strengthen measures for ensuring indigenous rights, including the right to development, the right to sustainable development. The international community needs to have an exact criteria how to measure an effectiveness of existing policies. Perhaps it's the time to create, in addition to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, an, uh, an Indigenous Development Index, following example of the Human Development Index. This idea is being discussed within the UN Indigenous Mandates. Dear participants, Our task as an international mechanism is to conduct specific studies and advice. The expert mechanism recently finalized the study on promotion and protection on the rights of indigenous peoples in disaster risk reduction, prevention and preparedness initiatives. Indigenous peoples are among the first to face the direct consequences of climate change. Indigenous peoples in the Arctic region depend on hunting polar bears, seals and caribou, herding reindeer and fishing and gathering, not only for food to support the local economy, but also as the basis for their cultural and social identity. New weather conditions are challenging food security of indigenous peoples. More specifically, in Finland, Norway, Sweden and Russia, rain and Mild weather during the winter season often prevents reindeer from accessing moss, which is vital for a food, uh, food source. This has caused a massive loss of reindeer, which are vital to the culture and uh, subsistence on, uh, of, uh, and uh, economy of Sami communities. Reindeer herder must, as a result, feed their uh, herds with fodder which is an expensive and not economically viable in the long term. In, order, uh, um, in the other hand, indigenous, uh, indigenous communities uh, hold time-tested knowledge and practices developed through their connection with their natural surroundings that make them sustainable to climate-related natural hazards and disasters. The expert mechanism study stresses that states should take every opportunity to secure the input of indigenous peoples in the development and implementation of disaster risk reduction initiatives and strategies. Dear participants, in September 2014, the UN Human Rights Council decided to request the expert mechanism to conduct a study on the promotion and protection of the rights of indigenous peoples with, uh, with respect to their cultural heritage, including truth, their participation in political and public life. One of the focuses for the study will be the impact of UNESCO Convention on safeguarding intangible cultural heritage, 
including how have indigenous peoples benefited or not benefited from the listing of their cultural heritage in the list. More generally, a key goal of the study could be to conduct a critical uh, yet constructive analysis of states and indigenous uh, and international organizations work in the field of indigenous people's rights and cultural heritage. The linkage between cultural heritage and tourism would be also investigated. A special attention would be drawn to indigenous languages as the main channel for trans transmission of cultural heritage from generation to another. We are very happy to know just some weeks ago that Alaska's governor signed a bill to officially recognize the state's 20 indigenous languages in a symbolic move. This example shows that a lot of support for indigenous peoples could be done on the regional level. On behalf of my colleagues in the expert mechanism, uh, I invite all interested actors, in particular universities and academia, to make an input to our next study on the rights of indigenous peoples to their cultural heritage. Moreover, we are now negotiating with several Arctic universities about holding an annual expert seminar of the expert mechanism in the Arctic that would, be, that would give an opportunity to draw a special focus on Arctic indigenous peoples and bring up good practices from the region. Dear guests, to, con to conclude, I'd like to stress with a deep satisfaction that indigenous issues in this Arctic Circle Assembly have been discussed even more than a year ago. It makes me confident that the Arctic dialogue will always include indigenous voices. I'd like to thank Mr. President for his great initiative and commitment. Many challenges indigenous peoples facing are common for the whole planet. Access to justice, language survival and cultural assimilation, consequences of climate change, rights to lands, territories and resources. Here in the Arctic, many of those challenges obtain specific multiplied value due to climatic and geographic conditions. Only cooperation in the spirit of good neighborhood and partnership between governments, indigenous communities, businesses, scientists and other stakeholders can be a key for optimistic scenario of Arctic development. In that regard, the Arctic states, member of the Arctic Council, and other partner states should be champions in sphere of indigenous people's rights. Thank you very much. First, before opening the floor for questions, I would like to thank the three speakers for their excellent words and interesting work also. So we have room for questions. So you are welcome to ask the panel. Here you are. Hello. Uh, my name is Chloe. I am from the University of Iceland. Uh, I found this very, very interesting. Uh, thank you for these presentations. I was wondering because like the <coughs> representative for the United Nations uh, asked for an input from the universities and academics, but uh, isn't it a risk that once again it's going to be people from the south and uh, not the native implied, uh, you know, <laughs> that would be interested and is there um, an interest from uh, indigenous people to, to reach a level in academic studies to to make their voice be more heard more often on the academic level. Is there an interest in that? Uh, thank, thank you for that question. Um, for, for the Inuit, uh, as Ukalik had mentioned in, 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 in her speech, we have been involved with the United Nations with respect to drafting of the, uh, the rights of indigenous peoples declaration. Um, and for academia, we, we, in Canada anyways, we're working with uh, certain universities to, to include uh, Inuit knowledge. Um, in one instance, uh, I was asked uh, at one point, is traditional knowledge still relevant? 
uh, I sort and that was from a scientist, so I asked that same scientist, uh, is science relevant? It's at the end of the day, knowledge, and if you if you choose one over the other, you're you're losing out uh, in in that comprehensive uh, understanding of of the world. And, and this is what we say in the North, is that if you're going to do work in the North, please include the Northerners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, I would like to add that uh, uh, the expert mechanism and other indigenous mandates within the UN system, uh, we hold our uh, seminars and conduct our studies. We are used to uh, to have advice by indigenous peoples and academia and also by states. We uh, distribute questionnaires to, uh, to states and indigenous organizations and we used to have expert seminars uh, in uh, different academic friends of our mechanism and uh, those academic friends like Auckland University in New Zealand and uh, uh, University of Manitoba uh, so they are very near to indigenous communities and we, we have an input, input, direct input from indigenous people. This is very uh, useful for us. Yes, thank you for the question. I just want to make a more general comment and that is that the discourse when we discuss the Arctic and different groups is often that, well, you have, you have uh, governments, you have business, you have scientists and indigenous peoples. but. I want to make clear that, uh, for instance, as far as Sami people goes, we have had our own uh, academic institutions since the mid-70s. So we do have an academic tradition. And don't put us into just one of those uh, boxes. But of course, the question you raise is also a question of, of capacity, as I guess it's no surprise to anyone that we are not that many people we have to focus. Um, like Anders, I'm going to be more general than, um, than academia. Um, Inuit uh, have one of the lowest graduation rates um, in, in, in every country. Uh, and um, sometimes, a lot of times we argue that it's because of the education and the way it's delivered. Uh, we try to, we fight for uh, delivery in Inuit by Inuit for Inuit. And um, we all, education is always one of our priorities uh, to increase the opportunities and so that Inuit, Inuit youth uh, and Inuit graduates have the choice to whether to stay home and work or go out to forums like this and work. Uh, we need more resources so that more Inuit graduate and contribute positively to forums like this. We will have one more question. I think we will take the one over there. Well, my question has partially been answered, but I'm just interested in hearing your thoughts on, um, on how to bring to uh, sort of um, confront the problems that sometimes arise um, in the translation between the kind of localized and experiential knowledge that you're referring to and the sort of more technical knowledge that we've been told in so many of the previous sessions is so central to Arctic politics. Uh, thank you for that question. And, uh, I, I cut my speech short. Um, and the one area uh, that Inuit have always had concerns about was, you know, the international uh, uh, decision-making processes. And I ended up having to go to Bangkok at one point for the, the CITES, uh, the Convention on International Trade of in Endangered Species. And, the Canadian Inuit um, rely on the polar bear uh, for subsistence. And they were trying to uplist the polar bear so that they would ban the trade of polar bear. But in Canada, uh, the Inuit are involved through their land claim process as managers uh, towards the conservation of polar bear. So what they use are traditional knowledge as well as science-based. So the conflicts sometimes arise where it took one biologist, uh, a polar bear biologist, 30 years to finally realize that the Inuit were, ma were more accurate with respect to the population trend and distribution of polar bears than his theory theoretical models were. So 
that tells you that traditional knowledge is quite comprehensive in the sense that you can take what Inuit experience in their home and that it's a continuous chain of observation which is very intimate to, to the wildlife and the land and the effects of the environment and that you need to include that aspect and not to discount it because there's no formal accreditation from universities or academia. But Inuit are in their own right very intelligent and need to be respected and given that same opportunity for the transference of knowledge. Like Ukalik said, we were taken out of the equation when it came to the education of our children. We're trying to now bring back the parents into that equation to assist our youth to prosper and to, to, to contribute to society as a whole. Thank you. Yes, I might try to comment a bit on, on your question there also. Uh, to, if we look, if we think that we have two bases, at least two bases of knowledge, systems of knowledge, if you will, uh, in the Arctic, the traditional knowledge and science, scientific knowledge. To integrate them or to combine them, that's something that is very easy to talk about, but it's not uh, necessarily as easy to do. What we did, uh, referring to what our colleague uh, Tsikara was mentioning on snow, uh, snow changes, was to look in the science world for what groups know most about snow and snow uh, classification of snow. And we found a group of researchers in Switzerland, Austria, that used around 30, 40 classifications of different types of snow. They were avalanche researchers, hence their interest. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one of our PhD students documented 318 terms for snow in just one dialect of the, the Sami language. So what I'm getting at is that, uh, well, translation, that could be a problem two ways. Uh, in this case, it was evident to all that the, the traditional knowledge of, of Sami reindeer herders was way more advanced and sophisticated uh, than the knowledge that science had provided to date. So that would be my comment. I have to close this session now. I would like to thank the speakers. Let's give them a hand. Now it's lunchtime. <laughs> <laughs>